call, if I can help, call me. Okay, everyone, we are live on Facebook. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our exclusive Capital Insiders call today. It is a jam-packed schedule, so we are going to allow and admit all of our insiders into the Zoom room and get started right away. Uh, so thank you for joining. As we continue to celebrate Women's History Month, we remember from last week that we found out that taxes rounded up the list of top priorities for women in this moment with 28.4% identifying it as a top issue. Um, and so we are super excited here to have um, Excuse me, I'm trying to do two things at once here. <laughs> we are super excited to have our special guests from the Patriotic Millionaires, our presenters today, to present their presentation on Tax the Rich. Uh, the Patriotic Millionaires are proud traders to their class. Members of the Patriotic Millionaires are high net worth Americans, business leaders, and investors who are united in the concern about destabilizing concentration of wealth and power in America. Their mission is to build a more stable, prosperous, and inclusive nation by promoting public policies based on guaranteed living wage for all working citizens and a fair share tax system. They have a really great presentation for us today. Save the rich, or excuse me, tax the rich, save America. 71% uh, of Americans believe that the economy is rigged against them. We know that. Um, and the patriotic millionaires think they're right. How do you rig an economy? You start with the tax code. When millionaires get a tax cut, the middle class pays either in more taxes themselves or an essential services cut. It's time we reform our tax code so that it works for all of us, not just the top 1%. So we're excited to be joined and I'm excited to introduce um, by several members of the Patriotic Millionaires, including Erica Payne, founder and president of the Patriotic Millionaires, Morris Pearl, former BlackRock executive and patriotic millionaire chairperson. Stephen Prince, CEO of Card Marketing Services. And Chuck Collins, senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies and an Oscar Mayer heir. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna let them present. All right, great y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, we are so happy to be here. Tax the rich, save America. And by the way, save rich people too. We don't have anything against rich people. We want to help them live in a better country as well. My name is Erica Payne. And as Katie said, I'm the founder and president of the Patriotic Millionaires. Um, we're joined today by three of our members, Morris Pearl, Chuck Collins, and Stephen Prince. If you want to learn more at the end of this presentation, please visit taxtherich.com. And just as Katie brought together Together, a group of people to hear this presentation. Our goal is to share this with lots and lots of other people. So if you can pull a group together, be sure to email us and let us know and we'll host one of these for you as well. So I'll turn it over now to the millionaires. Morris. Hi, my name is Morris Pearl and I'm the chairman of the board of the Patriotic Millionaires. I'm a computer engineer by training. I spent most of my career on Wall Street, the last 10 years at BlackRock, the biggest asset management firm in the world. After the crash in 2008, most of my work consisted of helping the governments figure out how much risk they were taking in the bailouts of the banks. Every place from Citibank here in New York to banks in England and Greece. So one day, I was on the top floor of a bank building in Athens with about two dozen bank executives. We were taking a lunch break from a due diligence meeting. And I picked up some food and I walked over to the window so people wouldn't see I was having two chocolate puddings. And for a minute, I thought I was watching a um, parade going down the street. And then I realized it wasn't a holiday. And I was seeing a demonstration of protesters going down towards the place where parliament meets. And then I kind of turned around and looked at the bankers I was meeting with and walked back to uh, continue our meeting. And I kind of wondered to myself if I was actually helping any of the rest of the people of Greece, beyond the couple of dozen people whose jobs I was helping to preserve by getting a bailout for their bank. A few months later, I left a 30-year career on Wall Street to work full-time doing policy and advocacy work for the Patriotic Millionaires. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chuck Collins. Uh, I'm the great-grandson of the meatpacker Oscar Mayer. Uh, my great-grandfather emigrated from Germany with a – he was about 14 years old. He had a recipe for sausage in his pocket, and he, and he made a fortune. Uh, my dad used to kind of joke, uh, 
our family, in our family, bringing home the bacon has a different meaning. Um, so when I was 26, I inherited part of that fortune and I promptly gave it away. Uh, and why did I do that? Well, I didn't think it was a good idea to have a society where a few families had so much wealth and millions of other people had nothing. And I didn't wanna be the beneficiary of that kind of system. Uh, I've spent the last 30 years researching wealth and inequality. I've written a couple books, including a book with Bill Gates Sr. about why we should keep the inheritance tax, the estate tax. I currently direct the program on inequality and the common good and co-edit inequality.org, the website. And I'm just happy to be with all of you from Pennsylvania. And I think Stephen is connecting. Okay. Is this where I come in? There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every time I hear, I think I'm at the right spot here. Every time I hear Chuck talk about giving away money, I don't know if I should shake him or hug him. I'm Stephen Prince, and I grew up in a little town called Waycross, Georgia. My family wasn't rich growing up, and I worked for other people for 20 years before I got the courage to start my own company, a printing company, when I was 42 years old. I put the startup costs on my credit card. Several years ago, later, my accountant reminded me that I was bankrupt. In fact, he told me everyone in town knew I was bankrupt except me. Well, it scared the hell out of me, and I just kept working, and a few years later, got the gift card business, and it just took off. I got lucky. Now I print gift cards for everyone from Walmart to Dunkin' Donuts. People join the patriotic millionaires because they know our class is getting away with murder. Did you know that CEOs are four times more likely to be sociopaths than the general population? That's a true stat. Rich people are mostly just a bunch of greedy bastards. I should know, I'm friends with a lot of them. But God bless them, they've been advantaged for so long, they've forgotten that they put their pants on just one leg at a time, just like everyone else. And even when the ones who inherited their money are convinced that somehow they earned it, and by God, they're going to fight to keep every last dime of it. America be damned. Every day, millions of people in this country go to work, do the right thing, pay their taxes, and try to lead a good life. And every day, they're getting screwed by the richest people in America, and it's time we put a stop to it. The patriotic millionaires first came together during in 2010 during the lame duck session of Congress when President Obama and Republicans in the Senate were negotiating a deal to extend the Bush tax cuts for incomes over a million dollars. So here were two allegedly different sides of the political aisle working together to cut taxes on millionaires. And it just infuriated me. And so I called a couple of millionaires I know and a bunch of them got together and wrote a letter to President Obama and to the Congress that basically said for the good of the country, raise my taxes. And the message was so shocking coming from a bunch of millionaires that it just blew up in the media. And we've been working together to raise taxes on millionaires like them ever since. Now, to be clear, we are not a partisan group and taxes are not a partisan issue. The majority of Democrats, the majority of Republicans and the majority of independents all think that millionaires and billionaires should pay substantially higher taxes. The only people who disagree with this incredibly unremarkable idea are the ones running the government. Could it possibly have anything to do with all of those campaign contributions they get from millionaires? Hmm. So listen, y'all, during World War II, the top marginal income tax rate was 94%. During the Eisenhower years in the 50s, it was 91%. Today, it's 37%. Who's in charge in Washington has changed countless times over the last 70 years, but the tax rate for the richest people in the country has gone in one direction, down. You know, most of the tax negotiations in my lifetime have taken place behind closed doors. And in the end, compromise legislation typically gets bipartisan support. So it's been virtually impossible to know who to blame for where we are today. But that totally changed in 2016 when the Republican Party took over the White House, the Senate, and the House. And they had so much power, they didn't have to compromise on anything. 
in 2017, they used that power to rewrite the entire federal tax code. Every single Democrat voted against the federal tax code changes. Almost every Republican voted for it. Now, this was actually pretty lucky because it finally gave us clarity on at least how one side of the political aisle thinks a tax code should be structured. Now, to be clear, some of the BS in the tax code has been around for years, but in 2017, Republicans decided to take full responsibility for it. They voted for it. They should own it. And you may like some of it or hate all of it. That's for you to decide. We just want you to start talking to your lawmakers about taxes, because regardless who's in charge, Americans deserve a fair tax code, and we don't have one. Did you know that last year, for the first time in history, billionaires in America paid a lower effective tax rate than any other group of people in the country? But you've got to ask yourself, like, how does that even happen? Well, we're going to show you by comparing a regular person's taxes to a rich person's taxes. Let's get started. So let's say that two people, two people, we'll call them Joe and Cammie work hard. Both worked full time last year, putting in 40 hours every week. Together, they made $100,000, just above average for a two earner household. They're married, so they'll file their taxes jointly. After paying for Social Security and Medicare, they take the standard deduction and end up with $72,500 in taxable income. All right, so y'all, let's step back here and we're going to explain a couple of things. Okay, so right here you see a chart of the federal tax bracket, and this shows how much you pay at each level of income. Everybody gets a standard deduction. That's basically the amount that the government says, all right, you need all of that to take care of yourself. And you only pay taxes if you make above that amount. We have a progressive federal income tax system, meaning you pay a slightly higher percentage of your income in taxes the more money you make. So after the standard deduction, this is for married people filing jointly, that married couple will pay 10% on the first chunk of their taxable income, 12% on the bid after that, and so on and so forth until they max out at a 37% rate for any income over around 622,000. So everybody pays the same rate as they move through the tax bracket. So a millionaire pays the same on that first 20,000 as everybody else does. And everybody maxes out at 37%, whether they make $622,000 a year or 622 million. Okay, so back to the work cards. With $75,200 of income after the standard deduction, the work cards will pay 10% on the first chunk and 12% on the rest for a total federal tax bill of around $8,600. Now, let's say we have two other people. We'll call them Ronald and Melanie Slump. They sit around all year tanning on a beach. One day, Ronald clicks a button on the couple's E-Trade account and sells some stock, making a profit of $100,000. The slumps would take the standard deduction and be left with $75,200 of taxable income, just like the work cards. They made the same amount of money, so the slump should pay around the same amount in taxes as the work cards, right? Wrong. Under our current federal tax system, the slumps will pay zero in taxes on that income. The work cards worked hard all year trying to get ahead, while the slumps, who were already rich, sat on the beach drinking strawberry daiquiris. At the end of the year, the work cards are almost $9,000 poorer than the slumps. So why does this happen? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the Republican lawmakers who rewrote the new federal tax code believe money should be taxed differently depending on how you make it. Here's a comparison with the rates side by side. Like the work arts, most people, most of you on this call today probably make ordinary income. You work, you make money from that work, you get a paycheck and taxes come out of that paycheck. Other people, and this is mostly the wealthy and millionaires, make capital gains income. You buy an asset like a stock, it goes up, you sell it for a profit, the profit is considered a capital gain. As you can see from this chart, capital gains income is taxed at a much lower rate than ordinary income. Okay, so let's look at another example now. Let's say the slump sold even more stock and made $400,000 in long-term capital gains profits. They take the standard deduction, 
then they'll pay 0% tax in the first 80,000, 15% of the rest of their taxable income for a total tax bill of around $44,000. Say the Workarts also had a good year. They got new jobs. They made $400,000 working 40 hours a week for 50 weeks. They also take the standard deduction. Then they pay into Social Security and Medicare. At the end of the year, their total federal tax bill is on $82,000. Again, two families made exactly the same amount of money, but the cocktail sipping super tan e traders end the year $38,000 richer than the people who work for a living. So the key takeaway here is if you actually work for a living, you pay higher taxes than people who live off investments. But that's not even the best deal in the new federal tax code. The best deal is to inherit money like I did. Okay. So let's say the work hard's got even better jobs. Singing full-time for America Sings. They're such good singers that last year America Sings paid them $11 million. They pay their Social Security and the Medicare. They take their standard deduction, end up with almost $11 million of taxable income. They pay 10% of the first chunk, 12% of the next chunk, and so on maxing out at 37% for all the income over around $622,000. The work hard's total tax bill for the year, around $4 million. Making $11 million a year is hardly a reason to sink Crimea River. But how does the work hard's tax bill compare with the slumps? Well, Morris, the slumps also had an excellent year. Mr. Slump's great aunt died and left her entire $11 million estate to the slumps. Don't worry, they weren't close. So how much will the slumps pay in taxes on their $11 million of inheritance income? Nothing, zero, nada. Neither the aunt's estate nor the slumps will pay any tax on that 11 million because when Republican lawmakers rewrote the tax code, they exempted the first 11 million from every state. 22 million for a couple. So once again, the work hearts and the slumps took in exactly the same amount of pre-tax income, but because they earned their money in different ways, one couple by working and the other waiting for someone to die, the slumps ended the year $4 million richer than the work hearts. You may have thought that we broke away from England hundreds of years ago and started our own country because we wanted things here to be different. But take a deep dive in our tax code and you'll hear God save the queen playing in the background. That's right, Stephen. The Republican lawmakers who wrote the new federal tax code clearly prefer an aristocracy. You want proof? Remember how capital gains taxes work? You buy stock for $1 million, you sell it for 10 million. You only pay tax on the 9 million you gained. Simple enough. But what if you bought that stock for 1 million? It grew to be worth 10 million, but the day before you're going to sell it, you died and the stock went to your heirs. In the new federal tax code, when your heirs inherit the stock, poof, the cost basis magically changes. Instead of the cost basis being 1 million, the value of the stock when you bought it, what you paid for it, the basis has stepped up to 10 million the value it had on the day that you died. When your heirs sell that stock, they will only pay taxes on the gains above the new $10 million value. $9 million of capital gains, totally wiped off for tax purposes. Now there are lots of gimmicks and tricks in the tax code, but let me tell you about another one. It's called the 1031 exchange. Stick with me here because it deserves extra attention as it benefits a certain well-known real estate developer whom we all know. The new tax code allows investors to avoid capital gains taxes when they sell a piece of property if they immediately invest it in another property. Let's say a developer buys a building worth $10 million, holds it for a few years, and then sells it for $20 million. He rolls that money into a new $20 million building. A few years later, he sells that building for $60 million and buys 1,000 buildings with that $60 million. The developer started off with one $10 million building and ends up with 1,000 buildings worth $60 million and still has paid no taxes. And it gets better. If you put these two loopholes together, 
what Morris described, the step up in basis and the 1031 exchange, if you put those together, millionaire real estate families can acquire billions of dollars of property without ever paying a cent in taxes. Let's look at the same situation as before, but instead of selling all those buildings for 60 million, the real estate developer holds onto them until they're worth 200 million. And then he dies. His estate will pay some estate tax, but his heirs will inherit all that property at a new basis. If they sell it before it gains any more value, they will pay no taxes on all of those gains. Pretty good deal. We've got to just stop here and think about this for a second. On one side is a wealthy heir who never worked, never contributed anything to society, who inherited hundreds of millions of dollars of property and contributed nothing to the country, nothing to build our roads, nothing to keep our water clean, nothing to keep us safe. On the other side are people like the work carts who go to work, pay their taxes, and do their part for the country every single day. Between a third and a half of all the wealth in America is inherited. Many of the richest people in America are not rich because they did something to earn it. They are rich because their parents or their grandparents or their parents' grandparents did something to earn it. And there's nothing wrong with inheriting money, of course, but there's no good reason that inheritance income should be taxed differently than other kinds of income. Um, all right, so we've talked a little bit about personal taxes. Now we're going to turn our attention to corporations. In, in 2018, if you ordered a box of toothpicks from Amazon, you paid more for your delivery than Amazon paid in federal taxes for the entire year. If you watched a single movie on Netflix, you paid more for your subscription to Netflix than the Netflix, the company, paid in federal taxes for 2018. And if you filled up your car once, you paid Chevron more than Chevron paid in federal taxes in 2018. Morris, can you explain how this happens? Well, there are lots of reasons why this happens. One of the main ones is the new federal tax code allows businesses to pretend they do business somewhere other than where they actually do business. Let's take a company like, for example, Starbucks. Let's say Starbucks has thousands of stores in the United States and a few dozen stores in Ireland. You'd expect them to pay a lot of tax in the US and much less taxes in Ireland. That would make sense. That is not the way it works. Most large companies have what's called intellectual property, a trademark or a patent, for example. Not like land or buildings, intellectual property can transfer to another country as fast as you can click send on an email. Picture that Starbucks logo. A smart lawyer can transfer ownership of that logo to Starbucks of Ireland, who would then legally own that logo. And Starbucks of the US would send royalty payments to Starbucks of Ireland. The company can make the royalty payments whatever they want. If they make the payments big enough, the company will show all of its profits in Ireland, even though they sold exponentially more coffee in the United States. Using this and other tricks, 91 of the Fortune 500 companies paid zero federal tax in 2018. Zero. So here we are again, with the work cards holding up their end of the bargain and everyone else shirking their responsibilities. The new Republican tax code lets some corporations pay only 10.5% on the money they oversees. That's half the current federal corporate tax rate of 21%. And companies can get a big tax cut for all the factories and equipment that they own in other countries. The more factories a company has overseas, the more it can cut out of its American tax bill. No wonder we're losing so many American jobs with a tax code like that. Now look, rich people and CEOs love pretending that there are good reasons why they should get to skip out on taxes. One of their favorite reasons is that they're job creators. Woohoo! job creators. Like there are little magicians who create jobs out of thin air just by waving a little wand. Look, I'm a business guy and I got news for you. I'm not a job creator. Sure, business people like me start companies and we hire employees. But one of my employees, they don't have jobs because of my benevolence or my genius. They have jobs because people really like buying gift cards. People will have jobs making gift cards even if I were to die because if people really want gift cards, 
another entrepreneur will come along and organize a company to fulfill that demand. In the lead up to the Republican rewrite of the federal tax code, there are a lot of CEOs pushing for a lower corporate tax rate. They said they use those tax cuts to create jobs. They even launched the big job creators bus tour that went all over the country. The CEO of AT&T, Randall Stevenson, was one of the biggest cheerleaders for corporate tax cuts. He was on TV constantly, insisting that correlation between tax cuts and job creation was very, very tight, and promising that corporations would hire tons of people if only they weren't burdened by having to pay taxes. Now, keep in mind, corporations only pay taxes on profits. Profits are calculated after expenses like payroll. So Mr. Stevenson's claim doesn't even make any sense on its face. But be that as it may, maybe he was just confused. Maybe he thought he would hire people if the corporate tax rate was lower. Morris, I just don't think so. You see, from 2008 to 2015, AT&T paid an effective corporate tax rate of 8%. That was well below the standard corporate rate at the time of 35%. So according to Mr. Stevenson, with such low taxes, the company probably hired tons of people. Nope. During that period, the company cut 80,000 jobs. And with their low taxes and the savings from the layoffs, they bought back $34 billion worth of AT&T stock, which increased the net worth of the executives in the company like Stevenson. Since the new tax code went into effect, AT&T has cut an additional 40,000 um, jobs. And last year, it paid Stevenson $32 million. Erica was just talking about stock buybacks. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, a stock buyback is when a company uses some of its profits to buy up its own stock, making the remaining stock more valuable. It doesn't do anything that change the company's long-term financial health or create jobs but it does make people who are paid in stock options, like millionaire CEOs, a lot of money. In 2017, lots of CEOs said they would use their corporate tax cuts to hire more people, but that mostly wasn't true. Instead, many of them used the tax cut to buy back their stock and make their executives richer. The year after the rewrite of the federal tax code, corporate stock buybacks reached an all-time high of around a trillion dollars. So business owners like Stephen don't create jobs. Corporate tax cuts don't create jobs. Stock buybacks really don't create jobs. What are just regular investors, people like me with money in the stock market? We pay half the tax rate of people who actually work for a living. Lawmakers justify that lower tax rate by saying investors are job creators. If their taxes are raised, they won't invest. So are investors in the stock market job creators? No. But let me explain. Apple employs thousands of people to make iPhones and computers. I am an investor in Apple. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Apple stock. The people who work at Apple, they have jobs because of the millions of people who want to buy iPhones, not because of investors like me. None of the money I spent buying Apple stock even went to Apple. It went to other investors who happened to be selling their stock that day. And to be clear, investors are not going anywhere regardless of the tax rate. The alternative to investing is sticking your money in a mattress. Last I checked, mattresses do not provide very high returns. Any logical person would rather make something and pay taxes on it rather than pay nothing in taxes because they didn't make any money. All right, but let's leave regular stock market investors aside for the moment and look at private equity. Private equity funds buy and sell whole companies. Their investors get the special investor tax rate. And even the people who work managing the fund, but who have no money at risk at all, they also get that special tax rate. Morris, are they job creators? Not even close. Look, here's an example. 2004, two private equity firms took over Toys R Us. Over the years, the fund managers love to say they saved the company and created 62,000 jobs. Did they? Well, prior to the private equity managers taking over, Toys R Us had at its peak 97,000 employees. 
The company was in good financial shape with annual earnings of $252 million and cash on hand of $2 billion. By the time they were done with the company, these private equity job creators had shut down all of its 735 US stores and loaded its once palliative balance sheet with $8 billion in debt. The investors made $470 million, but they destroyed a viable company and cost nearly 100,000 people their jobs. And they paid half the tax rate on the money they made as people who actually work for a living. So the new federal tax code makes it easier for corporations to skip out on taxes. It gives an advantage to people who already have money or inherit money over people who work for a living. And as you get richer and richer, there are more ways to get out of paying your fair share taxes. Uh, have I got the summary right, Morris? Yes. And the result of all that is our country is more unequal now than it has been in 100 years. The top 1% own 40% of the wealth in our country. Since 1990, their wealth has tripled. The bottom half of our citizens has seen no wealth growth at all. You know, it's like some sick game of economic Jenga, where we just keep on taking money from the people at the bottom and in the middle and giving it to the people at the very top. And it's destabilizing the whole country. Yes. People are taking the streets. They may have different reasons for protesting, but our citizens just cannot take it anymore. They are sick of seeing a few ridiculous rich people get everything while millions of people are being treated like second or maybe third class citizens. Regular working people pay twice the tax rate that I pay. So even if you have the same amount of income as I do, you end every year further worse off. In America today, Deaths of despair, deaths from suicide, alcohol, and drugs are at their highest time ever recorded. Two and a half million people are addicted to opioids. And for the first time in our history, life expectancy is going down for segments of the US population. With COVID, things have only gotten worse. Millions of people are unemployed. Businesses around the country have gone under, uh, many permanently. But to look at the stock market, you wouldn't know how bad things were. And here's a troubling fact. In the first year, and we're, we're at the one-year mark now, while over 550,000 people have died from COVID, U.S. billionaires, 660 U.S. billionaires, saw their wealth surge over $1.3 trillion. None of this just happened. Oh. Over time, in a variety of ways, a, re a relatively small group of people used the tax code to restructure our economy so it produced outcomes that are great for them and horrible for everybody else. I think these people actually want to live in a country with a tiny number of extremely wealthy people, millions of poor people, and no middle class. I don't understand why they want that. I personally think it's weird. But you can't escape from the results of what they created. But here's the thing, y'all. We can fix all this with your help. If the American people are paying attention, they can have the kind of tax code they want, regardless of who's in charge. So again, if you want to know more or join the fight to unrig the economy, tax the rich, and save America, including saving the rich people, visit taxtherich.com. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. You're getting so much love in the chat. Um, we are past our normal time, so I'm gonna send this over to Jeff to give us our call to action. Hey folks, I'm Jeff Garris. I am the Outreach Director with Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, where one of the things that I do is I coordinate our 99% Pennsylvania campaign. We're saying right there who we're standing up for and who we're speaking out for, particularly on federal issues. Um, I'm looking in the chat and I'm seeing a lot of folks are pretty fired up and angry about what we've just heard here today. And I understand how you feel because it was just a few months ago when I uh, listened in on a press conference uh, with the same patriotic millionaires uh, with Congressman Brendan Boyle. Um, and I was not surprised then a week and a half ago back on Monday, March 1st, when Congressman Brendan Boyle from right here in Pennsylvania representing Philadelphia co-sponsored along with Senator Elizabeth Warren, something that they're calling the ultra-millionaire tax. 
And this ultra millionaire tax would raise taxes on wealth for people uh, earning uh, with wealth totaling more than $50 million. Um, folks who have more than $50 million and up to $1 billion would pay a 2% tax on that wealth. If they're above $1 billion, they would uh, pay a 3% tax on that. This is a way that we can fund and rebuild our America coming out of the pandemic. It's also a way that we can make sure that we start to chip away at these tremendous wealth inequities that we see all over this country now that have gotten so much worse over the last four decades. They mentioned these billionaires who got wealthier during the pandemic. Well, 14 of them are here in Pennsylvania. We only used to have 10, now we have 14. All of them have seen their wealth increase significantly, some more than 40% increasing their wealth during these 10 months. So what we want you to do is we really wanna get people all across Pennsylvania talking about Congressman Brendan Boyle's ultra millionaire tax. And the way you can do that is to, uh, Katie's putting here in the clips, some links to some articles and some press releases about this new ultra billion millionaire tax proposal. Uh, we want you to take those links, share them on your Facebook page, tweet them out, let your friends know what you've heard today, let them know why it's important that we all get behind Congressman Brendan Boyle and U.S. Senator um, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and why, if you are not represented by Congressman Brendan Boyle, you should tag your member of Congress and ask them if they will step up and co-sponsor this along with Congressman Boyle. If you're in Congressman Boyle's district, give him a, a smile on Facebook, uh, tag him in this post, and thank him for introducing that. And uh, do that if you're even not in his district, but tag your own member of Congress to ask them to co-sponsor this as well. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. Thanks so much to the patriotic millionaires. Thanks to all of you for being here. Let's take action together to end this wealth inequality. Thank you so much, Jeff. I plopped those uh, links there in the chat and all these resources will be in our recap email as well. I'm gonna send it on over to Kadita to close us out. Thank you, Katie. Hey, everybody. Kadita Kenner, Director of Campaigns for the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. Grateful to have Erica and Morris and Stephen and uh, who am I missing? Chuck with us today for the Patriotic Millionaires. An awesome presentation. Again, I'm going to give it up. I, I, the chat box is going wild for this presentation today. Uh, definitely, I appreciate the fact that you all take your show on the road. Uh, Ricardo, Katie, and myself saw your presentation last month with the uh, Tax March folks and uh, knew that we had to have you, knew that we had to have you uh, with us today. So grateful that you're joining us today. And I think there's something so great about the fact that you are all here millionaires and you're willing to be tax he uh, heavier. And you know, I think that's what people really love and understand and appreciate. And you're getting a lot of love from folks uh, for, for the work that you're doing. So thank you for being strong advocates for this issue. So I don't have too much more to say besides the fact that we do have our Pennsylvania budget. It's the PA budget summit. Um, happens every year. This year it is virtual. Please join us. I put some information in the chat box. We'll share it again um, in the uh, links there for Facebook. But please join us. It's going to happen every now Thursday, um, starting at one o'clock, every Thursday until April 1st. Please join us. Get some more information so you can learn more about these issues and how we can advocate for ourselves. And with that, the last thing I'm going to say is I'm going to shut my mouth and talk to you all later. Talk some. Talk some. Talk some rich. Tax the rich. See you Thank next. You. See you next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>